Good evening and welcome to Café Still Point. My name is Claudia Knox. I'm an osteopath and a midwife and I'm one of the lecturers here at the Viennese School of Osteopathy. I have the pleasure to host Café Still Point today. Here in Vienna it's the um, last evening where other cafes are open too, so it may not be that busy here online tonight, um, as people might just use the opportunity to go out anyway. But I have the um, absolute pleasure to introduce one of my osteopathic heroes to you. I can introduce Caroline Stone to talk to us tonight. Caroline has been an osteopath for over 30 years and she's taught extensively in the UK and Australia and New Zealand and really worldwide. She has influenced many of us with her very pragmatic approach to visceral osteopathy and um, she keeps pushing for osteopathy to play its role in the overall regulation of the body's physiology. As part of that, she's developed extensive thoughts on the care of women and specifically mothers and babies. Tonight, she's going to share with us her thoughts on the shared function of the aerodigestive tract. She will give a three-day course on this in, here in Vienna in December from the 11th to the 13th. And today, she's not giving us as such an overview of that three-day course um, but she will share with us how we might place ourselves in the overall health care of the uh, patients that are involved with that system. So over to you, Caroline. Great. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Claudia. And uh, thanks uh, to um, uh, uh, Raymond and uh, Anya that have invited me to talk in the Cafe Still Point. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to talk about uh, this whole um, stomatognatic system because it's uh, it's completely fascinating. And um, people who know me think that I'm just, um, you know, uh, a, a visceral and pelvic and pelvic floor. Um, but really, I'm looking at um, anything and everything. And uh, it's this uh, area is so um, rich. Uh, with um, possibilities um, for for us to in, uh, to explore, uh, that I that I just think that it's it's uh, something that um, we would all um, um, be able to um, contribute to hugely. Anyway, mm -hmm. so I'm invited to, uh, to to deliver the course and uh, and this little commentary. Mm, that's great. That's brilliant. So, yeah. Good. Okay, so I'm I'm happy to um, talk through some uh, various things, and I'm also happy if people want to, if the um, anyone contributing, if they want to ask me questions uh, as we go, or if um, Claudia wants to ask. So feel free to uh, to interrupt as we go. You don't have to wait for questions mm. till the end. Okay. Um, so. I wanted to, I've called this talk Developing and Justifying um, Physiological Care Plans for the Aerodigestive System. So that's a lot of words. <laughs> the Aerodigestive System and the Stomatognatic System, which essentially surrounds it, is a very compl complex um, uh, and very three dimensional system. So, really, what we're saying is that anything to do with the upper respiratory tract, anything to do with airflow through your nose and sinuses, anything to do with swallowing or the tongue or in that instance speech also, um, anything within the head and neck and throat, um, all of that is aerodigestive and which is what the course is on, is about how the anatomy wraps around these um, various tubes that we have in, in the head and throat which are shared for both airflow and for um, swallowing and for um, uh, eating and so on. So it's, it's completely fascinating because you use the same anatomy for lots of different sorts of things. And I've put in here um, a plans. And so by physiological, what I mean is I'm not talking just about applications for TMJ pain um, or facial pain or for um, neuralgias, because that's obviously something that um, one can apply all of these things to. I'm also talking about how you work with people that are have swallowing difficulties, whether it's from an infant's perspective, um, whether it's newborns, whether it's latch, whether it's tongue tie, um, whether it's 
at the other end of the lifespan, um, geriatrics, whether they have dementia or not, how you support, you know, um, uh, you know, speech and swallowing in that um, group of people, or whether it's just um, uh, ear hearing, whether it's speech problems, whether it's um, language development, or whether it's sinuses, or whether it's, um, you know, uh, ultimately even ocular function. All of these things come into physiological. So it's, it's how people mm. use these um, tissues and, and how we develop a care plan. And um, uh, people get um, people get very uh, distressed when we say, um, what about having a plan of care? Because then they think protocol and then they think rules, which osteopath is supposed to follow. <laughs> and then everybody gets very really angry and say, I'm not going to follow any rules whatsoever. I'm just going to do what is individually applied to the patient. And I'm going to do what I want to do, what I feel. And I'm not going to follow a set list. And uh, I would completely agree with that. Uh, and when I say care plan, what I'm actually meaning is a framework for you to understand all of the different um, lenses through which you can view this function um, and through uh, view this integrative function. So it's definitely not a prescription. So it's not a protocol that you have to follow. And what it is, is a care plan is something uh, uh, along the lines of, have you considered this? Have you considered this? What about this, this and this? And when you put it all together, have you explored all of those things um, so that you know bring all the um, potential um, uh, interplays in this area. So that's what a care plan is. It's about, did you know how many things you should be exploring? Hmm. Here are the things that you could be exploring. It doesn't mean to say that you then have to do anything particular, but you have to be informed as to be three-dimensional, physiological, uh, understand the neuroscience, the pathophysiology and, and the mechanisms of action. And so if you understand all of those, then your case analysis can be really informed. So that's really what I'm talking about is that how how do we ensure that people capture enough um, and so what that then means is that you can it's much simpler then to brought to investigate um, evidence informed practice so we all know that we should have this gold standard of um, you know evidence based practice or evidence informed practice um, and we all know though that there is not one single osteopathic which proves um, everything and so there's never going to be just one article. What you actually have to do is to um, have a framework whereby you can appreciate um, uh, where you're trying to get your evidence from, how you build it up. And your care plan helps you to do that, which is what I want to try to uh, give you some examples on through today's talk with respect to speech and with respect to infant swallowing, for example, and latch and so on. Because... Um, Whatever we're doing, we need a collection of evidence. And um, it's certainly true that some evidence is going to be um, uh, more in depth than others. Um, but um, when we ex break things down a little bit um, and we have a proper framework, we can see um, where the evidence gaps uh, are more easily, which makes it easier to, to discuss things with um, outside healthcare professionals, for example. Um, but also um, what I'm quite keen about is that um, so sometimes when you have a patient come in and um, you don't know much about their problem and you say to them, well, I can feel stuff and we'll just try and see. And pa patients are, all, if you like, expected to give their consent for something which we say, well, we don't know um, how we can help, but I can feel things um, and we'll work on those and we'll see how it goes. And um, whilst you know, patients are willing to try anything, really. What I'm hoping it, one can achieve is if you have a better understanding of the um, complex nature of things, that you'll actually be able to explain, um, well, we have this level of evidence for this bit, this level of evidence for that bit. We don't have any evidence for this bit. This bit is still a hypothesis. But in that context, what, what do you think? And I think that's better than just saying, well, you know, this is what I feel and I don't know if it's going to help you or not. Um, so I, I think that we should be able to move beyond that is what I'm saying. And, and we also really need to get better at understanding from our patients what it is that the patient actually wants to achieve. And too often 
we come on a course and we say, please, Caroline, give me 15 techniques for the jaw, the tongue and the nose. Um, and, you know, having a bunch of techniques that actually help you to tell the patient how much relief you're going to be able to give them. And uh, I think that um, uh, if you, when you explore trying to develop a framework of care, you can more easily say, um, uh, you know, what's achievable, um, what's exploratory, um, what do we know will not make much difference unless the patient also does some, some exercises. It, we can give them a, a little bit better orientation as to what it is that they're agreeing to. Because what I'm hoping from either the course or, or whatever is that um, osteopaths get a really, uh, that they get a much level, uh, much higher level of confidence in dealing with a much wider range of conditions. Mm. Um, so that really it's about opening up people's toolkits um, and doing so in a way that they have a little bit more confidence that there is some supportive evidence uh, underneath them. Mm. Anyway. Um, but uh, so I, I've, it, along this vein, I'm, I'm trying to put together a little osteopathic society, which is called the International Society of Osteopathic Healthcare, which I haven't really launched yet. Um, but you can see the um, URL on the screen there. And it's more about how we actually put better information out into the public domain about what osteopaths can do. And so really this talk about is about how we how we frame um, evidence um, for the um, Aero Digest Act. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> here's a load of tongues, <laughs> which is probably my cue to quit babbling and get on with things. <laughs> so one of the fascinating things about the Aero Digestive Tract, whether it's to do with swallowing or speech, is that you use your tongue for both. Uh, and you use your tongue for lots of things, um, but and there are many, many tongues in the world doing many, many different types of things. Really amazing how uh, we have, as I say, this, this um, shared um, uh, tract, um, which um, has had to learn to be adaptive. And the, the very fact that it is so um, adaptive um, means that it, there's lots for it to go wrong. So the tongue is, a, is an architect, if you like, on trying to um, explore how um, uh, this zone functions. Um, and so if the tongue doesn't work well, then lots of things go wrong with breathing and speech and airflow and swallowing. Uh, but conversely, if all of this area has um, sensory or motor processing zones, then it confuses the way that the tongue can work and there's lots of fascinating reflexes uh, between the way that the tongue um, communicates back through to, um, you know, the brainstem, the trigeminal system and the vagal system and so on. And how the um, whole um, ability to communicate or to um, uh, eat and digest um, starts to become distorted. And um, young babies and children, there are lots of ways in which if you don't get all this motor pattern incorrect, uh, then it has long lasting effects. Uh, so it has lots of uh, uh, future um, uh, problems uh, can be set up by having a, having poor tongue function right from the outset. So uh, in general, before we get into too many details, there are, as we know, for example, five models of osteopathic care. There's the structural model, the respiratory circulatory model, there's the metabolic model, the neurological, the behavioral. And I know that these five models were established as the previous version, which was, you know, rule of the artery is supreme, you know, structure governs function and, and the, the original tenets of, of, of osteopathy. Um, but for me, these are a little bit of a confusing um, separation um, because uh, when you breathe incorrectly, which is part of the respiratory circulatory model, that can have a metabolic impact when you have the structure of the mouth and the tongue um, discoordinated, that brings in the sensory motor processing, which is a neurological model thing. When you come into maternal infant bonding and you come into eye focus and you come into attachment and orienting reflexes, then this is a behavioral state regulation for the way that infants 
alter their physiology to the mother and vice versa, such that the infant then can't swallow and um, suckle well if their behaviour orientation to the mum is stressed. So for, for me, there's lots of uh, uh, overlap between the models and it doesn't necessarily mean that um, when we're wanting to try to build up evidence about how we can support people like infant feeding uh, or with um, uh, learning development, speech delay, uh, language problems at school, how we then look at people with chronic TMJ pain or um, you know facial palsy or anything like that. How, how do we put the five models together with, can you help someone with facial palsy? It, I don't think they're necessarily um, uh, the, the best fit for us to try to hang our research framework on. And so what I think that we should be doing actually is if we have um, a central condition like facial palsy or infant feeding dysfunction, um, there are lots of things that we then can think about around that condition. Now, I can hear as we speak or as our class jumping up and down saying, yes, but we don't treat conditions, Caroline, we treat people. <laughs> we don't, we don't, uh, uh, you know, hang on to what the condition is. We simply find health. And I say, well, that's fine. Uh, but um, actually, what you need to do is understand the condition in order to appreciate what evidence there is around that condition, in order to then discuss with the patient who, quite frankly, brings their condition with them. Uh, and you have to speak to that condition in what you then individually understand that you can do with them for that. And so I, I think actually the condition should be central and that you try to find health for that person with that condition. Mm. So there's nothing wrong with trying to say, well, when someone has an infant feeding disorder, what is it that you're trying to help them with? Because there's lots of things. So whatever the condition is, whether it's infant feeding or whether it's um, trigeminal neuralgia, whether it's a swallowing disorder, um, there are things, uh, uh, you know, many people have pain, many people are looking for symptom change, many people are looking for improved quality of life and so on. So there's actually quite a few things that are common to all conditions. We all need to have qualitative improvement. We all need to have reduction of pain. We all need to have overall symptom change. We all need to, or we all should be aiming at physiological um, uh, understanding. We all should have a high, an anatomical basis. We should have a, a good scientific rationale. And I think there's actually a framework that we can apply to any uh, condition um, in order to help people um, uh, say, or how we build up evidence because if we for example if we looked at any condition that has pain and if we say well if it was whatever condition it is if there's pain how do osteopaths help people manage with pain and if you took simply just pain we could say this is a very messy slide so there's obviously lots of information here so when people are watching this video they can press pause and then they can read it um, because there's, there's lots of information on there but for example if you have someone whom is in pain you could say that there's all sorts of things where um, pain can be helped through breathing and relaxation. And there's lots of actual reasonable levels of evidence for um, pain relief with breathing. Mm -hmm. You could say that um, uh, actually if you apply a type of body psychotherapy or somatization concepts, that there's again uh, an intermediate level of evidence for that because osteopaths, there's, there's evidence for saying that osteopaths are competent at helping patients feel better connected with their bodies. You could say on this side, with the pain relief through breathing, the osteopaths are competent with their patients at discussing breathing dynamics, for example. Mm. Um, and that you could also then say that if you have pain relief through actual manual um, therapy techniques, there's actually quite a lot of evidence, or there's, there's emergent evidence about how using hands-on helps pain in general. The special care, there's, there's a lot about when uh, infants struggle with feeding, infants struggle with um, function in this area, um, that uh, actually what we're doing is just relieving um, a lot of their sensory irritability. And that actually doesn't really matter what the sphenoid's doing. It's more important for us to know that we're touching onto the trigeminal system and giving a little bit of useful afferent information to the um, infant in a calming way, such that the afferent input has a safe and supportive 
um, dynamic. And that, so, so long as you touch it in the right way, it doesn't matter what you're touching. And it doesn't really matter what, what's going on cranially, so long as you have a qualitative touch um, into what's going on. So there's quite a bit of emergent evidence into the nature of touch. Um, but you can certainly say that osteopaths are competent to deliver touch-based therapy. And so already, um, and, and even things like exercise description, so already, even if we're talking about just can osteopaths help the pain associated with condition X, there's a whole number of generic things that we can do, which in themselves has quite a bit of evidence. And when you then say, well, you know, qualitatively or um, to do with whatever symptom there is or, or so on, there's each of these little um, uh, areas will have their own body of evidence behind them. So when I talk about the stomatognatic system, it's not, um, you know, trying to find one research article which proves everything. It's trying to find out, well, if you have someone with a swallowing disorder, is it because the throat hurts? Is it because is it because there's a tongue tie? Uh, is it because there's dentition problems and um, bite problems causing deviation of the jaw? So what is it? that you are suggesting that you're trying to interact with, because each of these interactions will have then a different subset of evidence. And if you're willing to say, well, I'm going to work with this angle, this angle and this angle, then you can follow your evidence trail. And in that context, there's actually heaps, there's masses of evidence to support our rationale for engaging with all of these things. So. I think that um, uh, when we build up our understanding of whether it's the infants, uh, whether it's the school-aged children, or whether it's older adolescents or the geriatric patient, we have to understand a, a, a number of things um, which are slightly different to the five models of care. So we have to understand, for example, um, the con in the context of its physiological adaptation and the functionality. There's uh, lots of things that we can then measure. There's lots of outcome measure that osteopaths are really bad at, but which we should learn to, to um, uh, develop more. We have to understand the treatment that we give. So are we giving stretch treatment? Are we giving functional treatment? Are we giving cranial treatment? And I have to say that most research papers that are written about osteopathy, the main thing that they fall down on are, is the fact that when they say treatment, they say OMT. Now, osteopathic manipulative treatment mm -hmm. or they give um, functional and indirect treatments which is such a poor term woolly it's indefinable and so it had, you've got no idea what they did in this research paper and so it's sort of utterly useless really when you come to do a meta-analysis and put it all together so we have to be a lot clearer about what types of treatments that we're doing we also have Just, so we give hands-on treatment. Are we giving any exercises or postural advice? Are we trying to look at habit retraining or are we looking at self-care and things that the patient can do as opposed to what we can do? Because with many of the conditions for the stomatognatic system and for the aero digestive tract, there's lots of things which the patients should be doing themselves. And if they're not doing them, uh, then that limits the overall um, amount of, of uh, um, improvement that you can aim for. And so if we try to work out um, what we're doing, um, uh, we, we can sort of build up a bit of a strategy. So I've taken some um, stomatognatic system disorders here, such as mouth breathing, um, um, obstructive sleep apnea, um, uh, uh, apnea, um, voice disorders, there's a whole variety of voice disorders, or infant suckling or otitis media. These are some of the most common conditions we're going to be covering in the course, as in trying to get you to know how that you're going to then approach osteopathically people with these things. So whether it's a teenager with mouth breeding, whether it's an older um, middle-aged person with um, sleep apnea or, or um, an obstruction of the airways, whether it's any aged person who has a voice disorder, or whether it's the very tiny babies with the suckling, or whether it's the toddlers with otitis media. All of these things have an anatomical basis. Now, it's really easy to find all sorts of evidence about the fact that the uh, anatomy of this um, area can become um, constricted and constrained. So there's, there's, there's heaps of evidence about the anatomy. 
There's also an awful lot of evidence about the physiological um, rationale for treatment because so many people know about low oral tone. If you have low oral tone in your um, mouth and um, facial, that that oral tone literally then places your pharyngeal muscles at the back of your throat in a different relationship. It means that you breathe through your mouth and not your nose. And immediately you breathe through your mouth and not your nose, you have an enormous amount of physiological compromise. Now, this is extremely well established, um, such that if you have poor nasal airflow, then you simply don't get humidification. If you don't get humidification, then the way that your lungs expand and your diaphragm works changes. This is not an osteopathic idea. This is something which is physiologically being researched. And that actually what you want to do is improve somebody's um, oral tone so that they are forced to nasal breathe, if you like. And so what we can do as osteopaths is to then take this um, anatomical basis one step further and say that there are then techniques for us to stretch out or mobilize the upper nasal airway such that there is less impediment to people using their nasal breath and not their oral breath. So you can say that, you know, mouth breathing, we can support the um, needing um, nasal breathing to be improved. We can support that by various techniques. And there's a, there's a few papers around which is which describes how if you do facial mobilization or oral massage or, you know, um, facial muscle mobilizations, that, that actually improves your nasal airflow. So there's actually a good little bit of evidence about that. Now, then, then it comes down to, um, you know, what um, technique? So OMT is, um, are you doing just hands-on? Are you doing hands-on and exercises? And so this is something um, that osteopaths can also build in because if they if there's currently little evidence about the fact that some um, particular unwinding of the um, zygoma improves nasal airflow, that doesn't matter because there's also lots of evidence about the exercises that you can help your patients do, such as lip exercises uh, and strengthening of the facial musculature in order to improve their stomatognatic function so that you can um, quite easily advocate that are able to guide patients in self-help in that way. Now, I do think that we need to um, measure what we do. And osteopaths are, are, I'm afraid to say, really bad, terrible, awful <laughs> at measuring anything to do with what they do. Because osteopaths like to feel it. And if it feels better afterwards, then that's good enough for you know, pretty much every osteopath, as so long as it feels better uh, afterwards. However, we actually need to, at some point, measure something, anything <laughs> would do. Um, but it's only because if we measure something and we can say, well, whatever it was that I did, it changes this little thing. Now, in all, when we say it changes a bit of airflow or it changes people's quality, their breathing sensation, or it changes their sensation that swallowing is easier. When we say those small little things, those aren't meaningless, meaningless little things. Um, and it doesn't limit the scope of osteopathy by saying we can improve swallowing comfort or we can improve airflow. Um, and osteopaths are still trapped in this dying dynamic of wanting to prove that osteopathy works. Everybody else doesn't care. Nobody cares outside osteopathy what the theories of osteopathy are. They really don't care. What they want to know is, is there some measurable difference in the patient You've done whatever it is that you're going to do? And um, I think that um, if, you, if osteopaths could put down their insecurity about needing to prove the theory of osteopathy, all they need to do is to say, when a person walks out, they feel better in this measure, this measure, and this measure. Hmm. And those yeah. are not difficult things to do. There's loads, hundreds, thousands, I would dare say, of outcome measures, little simple things that you can fill in or your patient can fill in, and that you can have confidence that something has changed after your intervention. And when you have something that's written down, other than it feels better to me, yeah, um, it's, it's then something that you can communicate with somebody else. And what I'm really keen about is that we have something that we can communicate uh, to people. When you say that 
um, you know, I'm releasing this phenoid, the pterygoid was uneven, um, there was an irritability and a poor vitality through the buccopharyngeal fascia. These are terms which have no meaning to anyone outside osteopathy. And what I want to put over is that you can we can discuss what we do for mouth breathing or for um, sleep apnea or for whatever in terms which are better framed for other people to understand and so that this whole thing about how we work with other professions has got to be much more um, uh, key to um, our um, professional practice um, than just learning ever sophisticated methods of you know local manipulation of some structure um, so anyway let's get, get down to some some um, detailed information putting the evidence to one side for a moment what we really want to discuss is um, how are we going to help um, the um, tracheal airway tract uh, the um, the oral um, pharynx function um, uh, how do we help it work for both speech and for airflow and for um, swallowing because these are quite complex dynamics and when you look at it in infants and then in children and then in adults the whole anatomy of this zone continues to change so when you have the simple act of breathing or when you have the simple act of swallowing both nasal breathing how the airflow passes through the nose, over the back of the um, soft palate and then down behind the tongue, past the epiglottis and into the trachea. How that airflow goes um, really informs the way that your um, lung tissue expands. Now you might not appreciate that the suck, swallow, breathe um, mechanism um, for actually uses trigeminal sensory information from the nose. That trigeminal airflow that it's detected will help to speak to the respiratory center brainstem to actually help time the infant's rate of um, diaphragmatic breathing and excursion for suck, swallow, breathe. And many people, when they have someone with a breathing dysfunction, they leap straight to the abdomen and uh, straight to the thorax rather to this diaphragmatic area and they go to these lower ribs and they start fiddling around with the diaphragm they go to the crura and the upper lumbar spine and they're looking at the muscle of the diaphragm and actually what the diaphragm is doing is that it's receiving information from nasal airflow so the diaphragm whatever the diaphragm is doing um, is only going to be as good as the airflow that it draws the drawing through the lung tissue so most people i think um, skip over the upper airway um, too quickly because there's a lot here that we need to work out about how do we work with the uvula and the soft palate how do we work with nasal airflow and the nasal valve to actually get the airflow coming in how do we get the epiglottis um, mobile and at the right tension so that it works with pharyngeal tone to ensure that this passage of air gets into the lungs appropriately. So that's one thing. But we're using all of those tissues to do a completely different digestive tract function. So the act of swallowing, so eating, chewing, just the act of uh, deglutition, that's really complicated, but we use the same anatomy. And when you think about it, in, as far as your brainstem is concerned, your cerebellum is concerned, and your basal ganglia are concerned, when you get to those parts of the circuitry, they have to remember and trigger a swallowing pattern. Not the breathing pattern, but the swallowing pattern. But then when you have damage and tension and teeth extraction and you have pain and the muscles for swallowing get a bit distorted, what that then means is that when you're then trying to use these muscles to maintain your airway um, open for say breathing at night or when you lie down uh, then you can't do that effectively because the sensation and the neurophysiological communication from all of these tissues gets a bit blurred so your brainstem doesn't really know how to coordinate um, the action cleanly for either breathing or swallowing so it does neither well um, and so that's something that's really interesting is that once you start to have a problem in one area, um, uh, it, it rapidly feeds into other disorders and people need to be a bit more... Um, Caroline, can I yeah, ask a question? Yeah. Sure. 
Um, you were just saying the, the brainstem interprets the signals that are coming differently. So would, how, would you, how would you use that information in a therapeutic context? Would you then try and treat the area of the brainstem or would you try and change the signal that's coming in? Or how would you, how would you integrate that in, in your therapeutic context? Yeah. So you've got two options. One of the major focuses has to be improving the afferent information. Uh, obviously, there are three parts. You have afferent information, then you have central processing, and then you have efferent um, uh, information to give you a motor. Um, the final efferent arm either gives you a swallow or it helps to open the airway for breathing and inspiration. The afferent information is something that's really important. And so most of the time, what you need to do is actually work where the receptors are, because then if you altering this anatomy, it's going to send new afferent information through to the brainstem. And the brainstem itself is usually operating fine. So unless there's there been a stroke or some other form of, um, you know, circulatory insult to the central nervous system, most of the pathways and reflexes are intact, but they have just learned um, to have inappropriate reflexes because of adverse afferent information. And one of the really fascinating things about this area is that the facial muscles, for example, uh, and much of the tongue, how that is placed, because everybody knows the tongue is really important, stretching the palate and moving the teeth and um, opening the pharynx. The way that the tongue and the facial muscles and the mouth knows when to use the sensory trigeminal information, because facial tissues, facial muscles don't have many of their own proprioceptors. So actually, when you're trying to work these tissues, um, you're trying to use the trigeminal sensory, so number five going in for your mm -hmm. afferent information. So you're doing something to reset centrally that then processes but you'll get a motor effect out through seven mm -hmm. and so actually just fiddling with the central parts isn't going to change any new information going in and this is something that i feel is really important is that you can't just then say well i'm going to like a cv4 or or whatever because if there's nothing wrong per se with the inner brain circulation it's not going to do much mm because it's not going to then alter the original um, receptors and the afferent information. So this is what neurosensory processing is all about. And there is massive science um, and um, uh, oral function research about how you remodel these reflexes um, from a usage perspective. Um, so um, actually what we need to do is whether it's in the children with their small anatomy or the older people with their, obviously their slightly changed anatomy is to learn how the normal reflexes operate uh, because then we can start to speak to these things and to try to send new information in which then they have to try to model. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense. So, so just yeah. so that I've understood that correctly. So you, you would change you change the tissues that then give the brain afferent feedback so that the afferent feedback changes, which helps the brain to re-regulate so that the efferent reprocess. output reprocess, so that the efferent output is more normal afterwards. Yeah, because most, um, for example, dysfunction, most mouth breathing disorders, I mean, uh, they may have obviously a blockage in the nose, which means there's poor nasal airflow. So therefore they open the mouth to get airflow. But beyond that, it's actually a motor patterning, um, habitual um, disorder, many of these things. Uh, and um, uh, what you're trying to do is, is to um, remind the brain that they can do it differently. And you can only remind the brain to do it differently by giving new feedback. Yeah. So the feedback has to come from the periphery. So unless, unless there's something in a receptor somewhere, which is going to, that, which you can fiddle with and you talk to the receptor, you trigger, trigger new information in, that doesn't change the threshold of activity or the threshold of vigilance in the um, brainstem or the ganglia or all these other things. Um, and it's only when you do that, that the brain starts to say, uh oh, what? But how do, how do, and then processes it differently to give a different efferent outcome. Mm. 
So, so even just understanding it on a motor sensory uh, dynamic means that you probably have to think differently to ordinary biomechanics. Now, most of TMJ pain models are based on can the jaw open? Mm -hmm. Is there deviation? You know, and it's quite mechanistic. It's a bit two dimensional, dare I say it. And actually, most of the pain come, comes about because the motor effort um, the effort motor uh, information does not know how to balance itself mm. um, and because it's getting um, uh, mixed signals from the from the afferent information. So whether that's the palate or whether that's the tongue, whether that's the hyoid or, or whether that's the um, clavicle or all of this ventral fascia, um, whether it's global autonomic tone, it's getting mixed signals. Mm. And when you look at many of the symptoms that patients complain with, such as um, mouth breathing, what they're really complaining of, not just an open mouth, is that with that poor mouth breathing, they're actually getting poor gas exchange. And so when they have poor gas exchange, uh, then they have metabolic disorders, then their cardiorespiratory system changes, then their whole neural tone alters, their sleep cycling gets disrupted so therefore their cognitive processing gets changed um, and they have all sorts of other knock-on factors from that so they get a very wide-ranging physiological health-based problem from what some people are still evaluating biomechanically yeah. so what I do is to really think physiologically what's going wrong if I move some of this anatomy what physiological process am I trying to with so we have airflow which is to do with breathing but that and then the the poor out the poor airflow gives us noxious out stability which doesn't help for pain perception for example mm -hmm. if we have um airflow which is disrupted then we have whole sorts of this can be very significant, whether it's a Down syndrome child that has too large a tongue, has altered airways, that has problems articulating, or whether it's an anatomically um, neuronormal um, face, face, if you like, if those children have motor discoordination and they have retained primitive reflexes, uh, that, um, in, that poor communication can actually give... Um, um, if you have poor um, airflow, um, you also get poor immune consequences. And many, many people forget that when actually what you're supposed to be doing, nasal breathing informs your immune system and your um, and then you need hydration. So you need wet air going into your lungs for your lung gases exchange to be correct. So we talk about all of these things in the course, because if you have someone with chronic um, ill health, chronic ear, nose and throat problems and so on. Much of the story is that they're not getting humidified and immune exposed air into their lungs. Um, anyway, uh, when you um, uh, when you're also looking at your aerodigestive anatomy, it's one thing to get the air into your nose. But many when you think about it for infants um, and in, even for adults, what you have to do is you start to breathe in and then you say, stop breathing swallow start breathing and it's really tricky to coordinate most of us don't think about it you know we we're drinking away we swallow we breathe and then we have a drink and that it's become second nature to us but for um, infants and for young children the mere act of commute of, of coordinating swallow and then i'm swallowing <laughs> then you've got to break into breath but then you've got to stop breathing hold yeah. that thought <laughs> And that's really complicated. And so you've got to have lots of um, different um, sensory information uh, from that in order to get that communication to um, go through appropriately. Anyway, there's, there's lots of um, understanding and intricative understanding that I want to build into with the course that we're doing. So I've tried on this slide to put like a little bit of a cogwheel effect, such as you might have started thinking about swallowing, but then you th have to think about breathing. Uh, you have to think about breathing and the voice. Uh, you have to think about breathing and the rest of the somatognatic system. And really what you're thinking about is um, not just where the tongue and epiglottis is moving, but what's happening with airflow? What about carbon dioxide exchange? What mm. about blood pressure and, and um, so on? And so when you take your case history, you have to have a much 
broader understanding. I mean, things about social communication and the whole polyvagal theory and, you know, et cetera. And, and when you're trying to look at things like, I'm going to or I'm going to look at head alignment and airway shape. I'm going to look at the diaphragm, um, or I'm going to look at tongue pressures uh, and movement in the hyoid. Um, all of these things are actually all about um, motor sensory integration, um, you know, airflow, air pressures, how the bolus of food or fluid can move, and what implications that has for um, speech and hearing, for example. So we're trying to build up a much bigger picture of how we um, put these symptoms together. Mm. Yeah. yeah, cool. So thank you. <laughs> so there's lots, there's lots of, um, uh, you know, there's lots of things that we can continue to say about um, looking at the control airflow, looking at the autonomic nerves, looking at whether it's vagus or hypoglossal techniques for the sphenopalatine ganglion, for example. Oh, we might have lost her for a little while. For a Caroline, would you mind saying yeah. that last bit again? We've just lost you for a little while. Through in the course of on um, you can't possibly cover uh, all of it. Um, can I just can I just pause you there for a minute because we've lost the audio for you about thirty seconds ago. Could you just say that again? What you okay. were going to say about the course, please. Uh, it's a huge understanding the um, aero digestive tract and the stomachognatic system around it, and that even in a three-day course uh, we cover you know parts of the vagus nerve the hypoglossal nerve should we just pause for a moment okay Caroline, would it would it be we still don't have your audio back very well. Would it be an option if you turn your camera off, then we might get the audio better. I don't know if what? you can can you hear me? If you if you turn the your camera off, then we might get your audio better. At the moment we can't hear you. in order to Just let me know what it is that you want me to do. Okay. Right now, I could hear the first sentence okay again. So just try and start speaking again, yep. maybe. And we'll, we'll see if the, if the audio connection is okay again now. Okay. Um, so uh, 
what I'll try and do is to um, switch back through to the um, presentation. You tell me if it's. Yeah, I can hear you fine now. So. Trying to do in the. Uh, so what we're, what we're trying to do uh, with the uh, course is to explore um, the complex function um, of this area, whether it's to do um, do various techniques which can have many possible uh, outcomes. So the sorts of things that we, we will talk about in the course are how you assess the tone of the palette, how you alter um, the um, what intraoral techniques uh, you can do to help the reflexes that operate with um, air apnea. You need certain things to operate here appropriately. So we go through that. Uh, we um, look at some evidences about people that have been trying to do certain techniques for approaching different areas and to see what effects that has. Um, as I say, we, we've got lots of different sort of handlings that we can do, um, uh, whether it's for apnea or whether it's for, as I say, infant feeding. This, this is just a great, I think, uh, am I right in saying that you have my presentation up again now? Yes, um, is, yep. Yeah, we yeah. can. <laughs> anyway, this, this is just a fact. It's not something from the chance. Um, <laughs> and if they are doing good orally, then then their function will really work. And that there's a number of osteopathic myths I like to go through in the course about what's important for infant feeding. Many people feel that infant feeding mobilizes the cranium, and a lot of people were taught that tongue action onto the roof of the mouth will then mobilize the vomer and it's the vomer that mobilizes the whole reciprocal tension membrane in the cranium. And of course is to say that that's a load of old rubbish because there's no pressure on the roof of the mouth through the suckling action. It's actually a vacuum action and whilst it's absolutely true that if you have a good suck then your whole cranial mechanism opens out absolutely true but it doesn't do it through pressure on the roof of the mouth what it does do it through is other um, motor use of the um, pterygoid plates or these um, uh, temporal attachments and the pharynx it comes from underneath which then distorts the cranium so it comes from the, this motor action because of course the tongue makes a vacuum and the vacuum, the tongue moves down. So the whole point about feeding is that it opens the tongue away from the floor of the mouth. And you've got the breast in there anyway. So there is no upwards type of action. Um, it, a lot of the mobilization comes from underneath. So there's a, a lot more than you can possibly two seconds in the, in the talk. Mm -hmm or functioning actually mobilizes the cranial base through it, this alternative pathway. So it's really important that you suckle your cranium, uh, but you, you need to prove that actually you work here, these underneath thyroid and the laryngeal complex, and that actually many children, uh, um, they don't feed well um, because of the muscle tension and irritability in the infrahyoid uh, or suprahyoid muscle group. So the inframandibular zone, yeah, this is a, a problem area. And that many people, if they don't suckle properly here, um, then important for the trigeminal innervation on the bones of the skull and the trigeminal innervation of the dura the tentorium, which is informed by this proprioceptive action of um, under, underneath the mandible um, in relation to the tongue. And so if you want to have your dural mechanism eased, if you want dural irritability to be eased, you need to improve your trigeminal system, mm. which you do by improving the motor action on the inferior cranial base. And you do it through this action not through the traditional VOMA type dynamic. Anyway, the, the, 
there's, there's lots of things that we talk about in the course. And we talk about, um, for example, um, different perspectives that lactation consultants would have, or would have, tongue-tied practitioners would have, um, or midwives would have, or osteopaths would have when they look at evaluation evaluating so lots of these different professions are looking at lots of different little bits and each of the professions like the lactation consultants aren't sure uh, or I'm not convinced that actually osteopaths look at things as the lactation consultants do hmm. so when people say it has a biomechanical suckling difficulty um, many of the other professions are talking literal biomechanics whereas osteopaths should be talking about well if this moves inappropriately it's actually leading to altered autonomic tone and it's this altered autonomic tone which is disturbing their suck swallow breathe rhythms and so it's actually a physiological reflex not a biomechanical one and i don't think that's coming across intraprofessional like to do so when we're talking you know all these techniques that we do for infants and how we think it's working. I, I think I think we're saying, you know, um, uh, you know, one thing, and I think the other professions are saying another thing. And I don't think that we're explaining that we're not doing just a biomechanical interaction, and that, and that we're trying to actually get the the um, you know things like the vagus and the glossopharyngeal to work differently. Not that we're trying to open the jaw wider. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, no, the, 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 there's lots of things that yeah we can do. So the, the, there's there's many examples. Um, so you know we've talked about swallowing, but um, you know speech is something that I'm also very passionate about, and helping people to learn um, to speak. And whether it's little babies or whether it's um, older, you know people, whether it's um, opera singers or whatever, there's an enormous amount that we can understand about how this anatomy shapes sound. And I'll leave you to, for those of you that are watching the video later, to um, just copy this. It's only a short letter series of numbers. Just copy that. This will get you to the diva in the EMC video. You have to watch that. So there's a bit of apparatic dynamics and it's a bit of, you know, a bit of beatboxing. And what it does is the real time uh, video of the tongue the movement of the epiglottis, the pharyngeal space, the dynamics of the um, cervical spine. And it's completely fascinating about what on earth is going on with all of these tissues when you either sing or do beatbox or whatever. And it gives you then an understanding as to how variable all this anatomical movement has to be. So when you look at that, am I going to move these tissues to explore them, to test out whether they've got that three-dimensional capacity or not? And those are the techniques that we'll be trying to work through when we're looking at, um, you know, so whether it's the nasal um, um, resonance part, whether it's the phonation um, in the, whether it's the articulation with the tongue or the lips, or whether it's the respiratory part for speech, we've got techniques for all of that, which we'll introduce you to. Mm. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. With the um, literal vocal apparatus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot in this course. People, when they see the title Stomathognatic, I think people have no idea really what it's going to cover. And it covers a huge amount. It's completely fascinating. So, um, you know, th there's going to be something for for everybody in there, even to do with, you know, posture. And, you know, I, I can I can touch on briefly the whole story about tongue tie in adults and how much that alters your posture and the center of foot gravity, uh, center of foot placement and the gravity of your feet and so on. I've got I can wax lyrical. <laughs> Fabulous. Please. <laughs> anyway, but so we tell you the hyoid. We look at research that other osteopaths have done about manipulating, you know, for TMJ or hyoids and so on. And we can talk about the implications for um, ear function, eustachian tube drainage. Um, we can, um, you know, mention the um, social engagement system for the um, ear. Um, um, arousal uh, mechanisms, you know, we can look at otitis media and do all sorts of other techniques. And what we're really trying to do is to build up um, a series of um, understandings about 
the multiple ways that you can approach all these problems. So how we can add in um, so that so that we understand that, for example, with infant suckling, it's it's the vacuum, it's oral mechanics, it's autonomic tone, it's sensory motor functions. And then we can look at each of these things and say, well, what's the evidence for how do we help infants create a, back, a better vacuum? What's the evidence for how we improve their intraoral tongue mobility and um, throat dynamics? How do we alter the infant's autonomic tone? What evidence is there that we can improve their vagal tone? Mm. You know, there's masses of evidence about you know, just doing infant massage. And there's all the fabulous stuff um, uh, from, from the uh, Italians and Soma and, and uh, Citarelli with, this, uh, with the sea tactile fibres. Uh, also, um, Andrea's work, you know, from Soma about uh, uh, decreasing um, autonomic irritability in the neonate and, and what you look for in their neonatal assessments. Um, there's, there's lots um, that um, is being touched upon there now. So there's actually quite a bit of evidence in each of these parts when you break it down and the thing is there is lots of evidence about laryngeal mechanics and omt or uh, different types of manual um, dynamics on the larynx there's some evidence about respiration uh, breathing and posture there's also um, emergent evidence about the psychosomatics and emotional components of breath and speech and getting your voice out and, and so on so there's actually quite a bit of um uh, a framework for us to say actually if we're talking speech disorders or infant suckling when we split it into what's the anatomical considerations the scientific rationale what outcomes we can look at and what interprofessional liaison we've got we can actually say that there's there's a huge amount of evidence in sort of that overall care package for say it's better than, a, dare I say, elbow pain. Um, there's a lot of um, shared understanding that we can tap into. So the evidence that we what has proved, or we applied osteopathic techniques and it improved. We, we don't have to have the word osteopathy in there. We can make use of everybody's research to say that physiology says this, Handling says this, self-help exercises say that, and before you know it, you have got, you know, 50 or to 100 different papers which are supporting the overall engagement that osteopaths can do for either speech hmm. disorder. What to finish on saying is that um, when um, osteopathic professional um, bodies look to try to coordinate research, you know, all the things which are really exciting. Uh, what we actually need, though, is a way of putting the information, not just doing individual bits of information, but how we draw it together so that we have this um, this framework for the, for all these wider considerations. Um, so that's the sort of thing that I'm I'm the most um, passionate about um, is, is trying to get us to to move beyond needing to have one research paper that proves everything, and for how we can work with the fact that research. Uh, is never an answered question. There's no final answer. There's always just a yeah, yeah. It's next series of questions that need to be asked. So we get lots of questions and some yeah. answers. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Mm. I must admit, I, f I find it fascinating just in this short overview how you how you look at the interconnectedness of the various systems and how you seem to be able to actually define what our role is in influencing those. So I feel often in, in these discussions, we talk about the interconnectedness, but then we lose our own role. I find it quite fascinating how you seem to be able to determine quite well what the osteopathic role in those systems is. Yeah, no, and, and I, I think we do have a role and there's no need for us to try to take over somebody's existing role. We have a really good role. If only we just feel comfortable sharing that because we fit very well with everyone else there's no there's no competition mm. we should be adding yes not pleading yes no excellent <laughs> good i'm just going to check if there's some questions from the audience from tonight no questions at the minute i tell you they're all out using their last night sitting in a cafe <laughs> so we might get those questions later <laughs> 
I complete. I completely am, am there with people to uh, have their last little bits of freedom before it all goes mad before Christmas. So uh, I'm hoping that everyone is going to be able to have a really nice yes. uh, Christmas as much as it allowed. But uh, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm just going to summarise that again. So your course is going to happen at the WSO from the 11th to the 15th, sorry, the 13th to the 15th of December. Yeah. Um, no, the 11th to the 13th of December. I will get it right. <laughs> So it's a Friday yeah, to Sunday um, at the school and it um, you obviously present it in English and it will be translated into German. So even for those yeah. in the audience tonight who might have found that a bit challenging listening in English, they, uh, there will be translation yeah. uh, and there'll be lots yeah. of hands-on work and you'll explore lots these themes a bit further. Yeah, absolutely. People will go away with, with, um, with, with things in their hands that they can then use, but also supported by you know, lot, lots of evidence. So there'll be some talk. And and with with the group, I'm hoping that we'll really be able to um, move people's palpation on. It, it, it's uh, in a, a, an involuntary mechanism course. So it doesn't matter, though, if you are a person who's biodynamic or cranial, but involuntary or structural. Uh, the point is I teach you how to find structures and then how to work with them, so it's applicable for whichever modality you are. Really, it's it's uh, user friendly to all flavors. Yeah. So, say again, it's user friendly too. You just cut out there. All flavors, all flavors of osteopaths. Okay. Would Would you recommend anything as far as preparation for the course goes in December? So I just so um, I, I think. If you come to the course and you are interested in paediatrics, that's fine. If you come to the course and you're interested in um, vocal and singing and, um, you know, people needing to speak for a living, all of these things are possible. And we will be able to um, adjust the, um, uh, you know, aspects of the course content to your particular, you know, uh, need. So you can come with any particular question because we'll be able to to frame what we're saying towards any particular um uh, you know sort of uh, patient group mm -hmm. fab excellent i'm really looking forward to that i think it'd be fab <laughs> fabulous um i think i'll uh, leave our audience with an encouragement to uh, keep on tuning into cafe still point in the next days and weeks um, i think we all find that um, massive encouragement as sort of life gets a bit more narrow in the next time or so for everybody in the UK as much as in Austria. Um, and yeah, I would just like to invite you to keep on tuning in at uh, uh, six, seven o'clock every evening. I just needed to convert in UK time to Austrian time. Um, and I hope you have a good night. Take care. <laughs>